Welcome to Health Now from WebMD. I'm your host, Carrie Gann. We have a great show today, but first, take a second to make sure you've subscribed to our show wherever you're listening to podcasts. It's the best way to make sure you don't miss any of our episodes. Thanks. Okay, let's get started. A few weeks ago, we aired an episode featuring a conversation with one woman, Sandra Abravaya, about what it's like to be a caregiver for her husband, Brian, who was diagnosed with ALS in his late 30s. She's just one of the estimated 53 million Americans who provide unpaid care for a family member. While caregiving is an act of love and service for an important person in your life, it can also take a major toll on physical and mental health. We wanted to continue to focus on caregiving through a conversation with another family about how it's shaped their lives. Today, we're speaking to Jane and Jerry Grillo, a couple who are both New York City and Metro Atlanta transplants live in North Georgia with their 20-year-old son, Joe, who has cerebral palsy. You'll see cerebral palsy, or CP for short, defined as a group of disorders that affect your ability to maintain balance and posture. Someone with a mild case might have trouble walking, but someone with a severe case like Joe might not walk or talk. And like Joe, they could require lifelong care. Jerry and Jane and Joe Grillo, welcome to Health Now. Thank you. We're excited to be here. Thanks a lot. So great to talk to you all. Um, I suppose the best way to start is to tell us a little bit about Joe and his condition. How exactly does CP affect him? Well, I'll I'll dive in and just start by saying it it affects him uh, sort of globally in in a way. You know, on the one hand, we don't want that to be the thing that defines him. But on the other hand, it definitely is the thing that that influences just about every part of his life. And uh, we can let Jane uh, jump in and give some specifics. But if you can just imagine every moment of your life being affected by this neurological condition, that's putting it, putting it mildly, but that's Joe. Yeah. So Joe uses a wheelchair. He is nonverbal. Um, and so he uses a G tube to eat because CP affects your ability to swallow. And so Pretty much every part of Joe's daily living is impacted by his CP. And so, you know, we have to support him for all those needs. And everybody with CP is different, of course, but Joe definitely is in what they call in in, uh, the Georgia school districts, uh, low incidence, which means he's in the minority of people with CP but he does have a high level of needs. And he's there with you now, is that correct? Yes, he is. Joe is with me right now. Joe has really good hearing, so he's very interested in any kinds of conversations going on around the house. Right. (laughs) And has great receptive language skills. So um, even though Joe may seem on the surface like he's a person who has trouble understanding what's going on in the world around him. He really is pretty sharp. I understand he's quite a music fan as well. What are some of his other interests? Oh, well, oh, gosh, that's, movies. that's a dad and Joe thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he's, um, it's interesting. He, he, um, he loves movies. He's a big movie fan. And, and uh, from time to time, with help from his mom or uh, or anyone else who you know who will ask him a set of questions will actually review some movies he hasn't done that a lot lately of course he hasn't gone to to see any uh, big screen movies in quite a while but um so he's a big movie fan aficionado he, he loves the uh, the superhero flicks um he loves sci-fi also of course he loves comedy and as he's gotten older um, we let him watch some, you know, a little bit more adult comedy, and he, he really enjoys that. I think he enjoys the curse words. I know he enjoys <laughs> the curse words. Um, but music, yeah, is a, is, a, is a big favorite of his, and he loves to listen and also to participate as much as possible. You know, he likes to play drums or cymbals especially, and he's got his own, you know, his own rhythm and his own sense. But he has helped, uh, he's helped his mom and I become... I think uh, 
bigger fans of music. Wow, that's pretty great. That's something you can all uh, share in and, and do together. That's awesome. Do you remember when you learned that Joe was going to be affected by this condition? Well, he yeah. was a 26-week preemie. <sighs> Joe spent a lot of the first part of his life in the NICU. And so we were sort of already preparing ourselves for some developmental delays due to his prematurity. But they told us uh, pretty early on, um, just looking at, you know, the, his ATNR, his, his, the way he held his body and uh, some other indicators that he was going to have CP. And, uh, and then there were a couple of other, he had infantile spasms, which is a seizure disorder and some other things that have cropped mm -hmm. up. Um, if you talk to most parents mm -hmm. of children with developmental disabilities, they'll be able to identify mm -hmm. more than one diagnosis for their child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's just kind of how it works. <laughs> So, but it was very early. It was very early when we learned. What was your reaction at that time? Do you remember kind of how it made you feel? Because you have you have an older daughter, um, Samantha. Yeah, she was 14 when Joe was born. And she was kind of the opposite end of the scale. She was in the gifted program in yeah. school, um, highly intelligent, um, you know, uh, verbal, you know, all of that. So yeah, it was a, I think for me, um, I can't speak for Jerry, but I thought that CP was a birth defect. Um, mm -hmm. I knew nothing about it when I learned about the, um, what it actually mm -hmm. is, you know, a neurological disorder, which in Joe's case was caused by a lack mm -hmm. of oxygen to his brain, because as a preemie, his lungs were underdeveloped. So I had a lot to learn, actually. Um, and we had early intervention services coming right out of a hospital. And that really made a huge difference for me learning about, you know, disability resources and treatments and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, that was so important to us. Jane's putting it very uh, simply, but what she gained was a PhD level of um, of knowledge in in this area that between us, you know, you could almost fill a thimble with what we knew about this, and that's all Jane because she had a, she had more a little bit more knowledge about CP than I did. But I mean, what she learned as far as the services, um, what she was able to gain from the um, early intervention was absolutely invaluable and it's one of those gifts that uh that keeps on giving i mean for our family it's it's been absolutely foundational for us all i mean all these years later so i mean i can't emphasize uh that enough both the services that were available and her ability to take that and leverage that into uh you know and actually into, into finding out more and in some ways um creating more well i can't imagine how overwhelming it must have been to get that diagnosis because not only have you had you been feeling the the stress of having a, a preemie who needed lots of care but then you also learn that there's you know a condition that will affect your son for the rest of his life in addition to just the stress of caring for for a newborn what was it like emotionally for you at that time if you recall I think we, we were in panic mode, like sort yeah. of uh, living in fight or flight <laughs> existence for, yeah. for quite a while, uh, um, especially uh, because Joe started having seizures. Um, you know, the CP actually kind of took a back seat to that because, you know, seizures are pretty intense. I think we really just both of us understood that we had to put everything on hold until we could kind of get a handle on things. And uh, that, that is a big learning curve for families when they first get a diagnosis, um, is that sometimes uh, you want to uh, drop out completely and practice denial, but when you have a child like Joe, you can't. 
because this person right. has constant needs. So you go into, as I said, you know, fight or flight mode until, until you don't have to. <laughs> right. I've, I've always called it, um, it's weird since I, there was a phrase we came up with there, especially during those, those mm. first couple of years, uh, foxhole readiness. <laughs> mm. Yeah. And, you know, neither of us having, having been in the military and not to diminish what that actually is, but we, we felt like that was sort of the, um, that was sort of the stress level we were at or the readiness level. This was all new and fresh and every day was, was something new. And, and um, Jane mentioned the seizures that came up that, you know, the infantile spasms, it was scary stuff. And, uh, but we, we approached it by trying to learn about it and we videotaped and we did things to, to help our, to help Joe's neurologist understand and that kind of thing. All of that to say very tough times for a few years, very, uh, a lot of stuff coming at us like a fire hose. Certainly. Well, and we mentioned that you have um, an older child, Samantha. How does raising a child with Joe's health challenges compare to raising a child who's able to communicate with you in the, I guess, the, the standard way that everyone's accustomed to? <laughs> well, my first thought, and Sam's probably going to kill me, but, but my first thought was honestly, raising a teenage girl is n not very different from raising a nonverbal child. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I think it's about loving your children for who they are learning about their individual strengths and weaknesses and parenting to those strengths and weaknesses. So um, Sam had, you know, frankly, some emotional needs because here she is, she had been an only child for 14 years. And now all of a sudden her parents were kind of absent parents. We were in the hospital. We were rushing to doctor's appointments. We were distracted by uh, all these appointments and things that we were learning about her little baby brother. And she was kind of, you know, uh, pushed to the background. And so um, we had to learn how to cope with Sam's emotional needs and help her uh, protect her normalcy uh, as much as we could. And then we had to um, devote, you know, all this time to an infant uh, child who had a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of needs. So it, it was, um, it was pretty challenging. And, and I, I think that all parents who have multiple children, um, whether they have multiple children with disabilities or one child with a disability in a, you know, group of uh, typical developing kids, you know, parenting is always a challenge. It's just, you know, specific to your child. <laughs> right. What kind of treatment is Joe getting right now? Well, it's interesting because I don't, you don't, you're not really treating the CP, you know, per se, and everybody's different. Everybody with CP is different. And, and so the, um, the sort of the ancillary results of CP are often what is treated. So in Joe's case, he, he has this high tone, this um, spastic quadriplegia, which affects joints, his, his bone strength. Um, it makes him tight. You know, we often, we sometimes use the analogy that, because his his uh, disorder, his brain disorder, is such that he may be sending a thousand volts of of electricity to um, to a movement that requires only twelve. You know that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. he, he's got a he's got very high tone. He's stiff, and so that's caused some issues uh, for his physical development, right? And so that's just one one part of it uh, of course he gets a lot therapy is a big part of his treatment plan physical therapy jane could definitely speak, speak well, better to uh, since he has reached puberty last growth spurt has caused some issues with his hip actually his left hip 
is dislocated. So we're looking at some surgery. Well, he's having a uh, proximal femoral resection specifically. And, uh, and then he has scoliosis, which developed post puberty. So we're having some orthopedic issues that we really didn't anticipate or because he's been doing therapy for years and years and years. And we were always told that some things like this could happen, but his, his skeletal integrity was pretty good up until about, I, I guess, two years ago. And, and we've slowly been dealing with that. So his treatment plan now, a big part of it is managing his pain particularly with, unfortunately, COVID has delayed our ability to get this surgery done. Right now, at this moment, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta is postponing some surgeries because they simply don't have any beds. Right. So we're you know, kind of dealing with these multiple situations. So we're treating his pain with meds. We're doing a massage. We have a massage therapist that's working with him just to trying everything we can do to make his quality of life a little better. And uh, we hope to get back to aquatics, which is a very effective therapeutic tool for Joe. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, being in school and general mental health and quality of life is part of his treatment plan. Because if you don't have a good quality of life, then you don't have a really good life. The issue with his hip has come on not so much suddenly, but quickly in that it's ramped up, you know, his discomfort level. And like he had had hip surgery when he was about eight years old, a different, you know, a different procedure. But and we understood then, as Jane said, that, that this might come back, but we really had no under, quite understanding of what, of the severity of, of it. And of course, who could have predicted uh, COVID and the, and the challenges that's presented well, and I'm glad you mentioned COVID because, I mean, that's upended life for everyone. But certainly, if you care for someone who's medically vulnerable, it's even more upended your world. So I, I kind of wanted to ask you about a normal day of taking care of Joe and what that looks like. But maybe your answer would have been different uh, before March of 2020 than, <laughs> than it is now. But can you tell us a little bit about that? One of the big things was, of course, he wasn't going to school in person and he was doing it from, you know, from home. And that, that was actually an interesting and I mean, I think very positive uh, experience. The fact that, you know, we found out and he found out that he can, he can do school virtually and that, and it worked for him. It worked for his teacher, but it, it you know, but it isn't the same. And when, and those few moments that he's had a chance to go back in person um, this semester, really did make a difference and that but that's that's really just scratching the surface jane can can speak to the challenges that uh that covid presented in terms of the day-to-day for joe yeah i mean i think a normal day for joe we wake up uh joe is not a morning person so we wake up (laughs) slowly and gradually (laughs) i hear that i'll give you an example uh when i go to give him his meds in the morning he pushes my hand away (laughs) please leave me alone so i i we have a music in his room so i i put the music on for him and let him kind of bring bring the world up to meet him very slowly which is exactly what i did with our daughter when she (laughs) had to get up for school so that's that's a pretty typical parenting there but Mm -hmm. um and then uh, once he's up and you know we give him his breakfast and as i said he's g-tube fed so everything is liquid and uh, so that has to that he depends on someone else to to feed him, and then um, we've discovered that Joe really does like Zoom meetings. He, he has a cortical visual impairment that's connected to his brain injury from the prematurity, but he um, he likes Zoom meetings. And doing school online w- went a lot better than I thought it would, but. 
At the beginning of this school year, Joe got the vaccine and all actually all three of us are vaccinated. And so we felt like putting Joe back in the school, in person school would be really beneficial for him because community is essential. Joe's, Joe, even though he's a nonverbal person is a very social person. And having him in school, frankly, allowed me, you know, to free up my day so I could, instead of kind of caregiving and working at the same time, he could go to his job at school and I could go to my job. So, and Jerry could go to his job. So that was um, really a beneficial uh, thing for us. Um, Joe is able to attend school until the semester of his 22nd birthday. That's the federal law regarding special education, specifically called IDEA. And so he can go till he, even though he graduated um, last year, he tip, he can still continue to go to school. And that is such a big thing for caregivers of children with significant disabilities because it's basically a continuation of day services and it doesn't cost us as a family anything it's just free day services right. and they're good they're good services his teacher is amazing his education team is amazing and um and i have some ability to roam about the cabin so, and that's, I mean, that's another point. The, the COVID situation completely changed your life because you weren't able to access those kinds of services. So it was just basically you, you guys responsible for his care 24 seven. How, how has that affected you guys? You know, how do you manage to maintain your, your careers, your relationship with each, with each other? Uh, do you have additional caregiving help that you rely on? You know what? It's interesting. It, in many ways, it brings us closer because we're on top of each other 24/7. Right. Like seriously, we, you know, I'm I work in a, a job that allows me to work from home exclusively, and Jane is, you know, did the same thing. Um, you know, was working from home and still doing her her uh, job as a as a parent mentor for the school system. So we just and we uh, maintained um, our uh, our weekly caregiver, Joe's. A uh, longtime friend and and caregiver Rebecca, who uh, comes in three to four times a week, and so we sort of kept that schedule going. But naturally, we were here the whole time. One of the things that was interesting about how that's changed, you know, it's almost day to day, but not quite. And um, Jane and Joe have, have gotten more involved doing projects like videos and this kind of thing. Um, you know, it's made us a little more creative. We even did some stuff early in the, you know, some stuff with Joe called the quarantine where, um, you know, his little adventures um, sort of during a pandemic. <laughs> so Jerry and I have always loved to hike. And uh, Joe, when he was little, we could hike together. <laughs> but, um, but now he's, uh, you know, unless it's a handicap accessible trail, which we've found a few of those. Georgia has some of those. But it's nice for us to be able to escape out on into the woods. We do have a Saturday uh, respite caregiver who comes and, you know, she's actually one of the para pros at Joe's school. So she knows him and we feel a hundred percent confident in leaving Joe with her, which that is a big obstacle for a lot of caregivers, particularly people who have a child with behavior issues. So just Disciplining yourself to walk out the door with your spouse is a huge step. <laughs> yeah, that takes a lot. That and does... uh, but 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 the hikes are we have so much fun, and we don't talk oh, yeah. about Joe at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, right. Wink, wink, wink. But, but it's true. We've we've gone. We have gone on some. Um, thank thank goodness for yeah for that. Um, that occasional Saturday hike, we've gone to some pretty interesting places. It's, you know, and so, yeah, that's, that's one of our, 
definitely one of our getaways. You really do have to make a commitment to take care of yourself and do the things that restore you because it takes a lot of planning and also just, you know, the thought of being away if something were to go wrong. You know, it sounds like you guys have a good support network in place um, for that. But can you talk about the importance of sort of making sure that you are taking care of yourself? It's funny, I was actually talking to a friend of mine this morning, and she was telling me she has a, a child uh, who ha is on the autism spectrum, and she um, was talking about how she reached out to another uh, friend who's husband was ill or something like that and she she texted her a picture of a big bag of potato chips and said this is what my self-care looks like what does your look yours look like <laughs> so we were talking about how you know sometimes self-care is you know uh, going outside for a walk or taking a long shower or, you know, um, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, like a, a, a weekend at a resort. It, it can be as simple as, like I noticed, uh, you know, like Jerry will sit outside sometimes and um, sometimes, or take the dog. We have a big baby of a dog. And yeah. It's, she requires a lot of our attention as well. So taking her okay. for a walk or, you know, things like simple little things like that um, can really put some energy in your, you know, your energy bank account, you know? Right. That's true. I, I mean, I, I sneak out a lot as often as I can to go uh, shoot basketball for about 30 minutes, you know, just to, you know, like a Zen moment. <laughs> yeah. It's just like not making it a big production. It's just finding those little moments here and there that you can take advantage of. That's it. Jane, you and Joe star in Transition Tuesdays, which is a vlog, a bit a video blog for the Georgia Parent Mentor Partnership, which is an advocacy group for students with disabilities. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and your involvement with this group. Yeah, so, well, actually, that that is the work that I do. Um, Joe does have some advocacy groups that um, he's involved with, but that is actually my um, career since um, we had Joe. Uh, the Parent Mentor Partnership is a um, program through the uh, Georgia Department of Education, and they hire parents of children who receive uh, whose children receive special education services in their school district to be a you know kind of a, a guide for uh, or actually a bridge between schools and home. So we help parents find resources, teachers find resources. I spend a lot of time talking to families about things like transition planning and how to navigate social security and just all kinds of things like that. And what do you, what do you mean by transition planning? Just for people who aren't familiar for, uh, so what is your child going to do when they are done with school? That's, that's the crux of transition planning. Yeah. Thank you for asking that. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, when the quarantine started and we weren't in school anymore, Joe and I decided that we were going to do like a little video series to help other families with, you know, learning about things, transition related things and just day to day things relating to people with disabilities. So I, I kind of was doing it as a function of my work as an advocate, but then we realized that this could be Joe's future. Joe communicates by answering yes and no questions, uh, sometimes facial expressions. Um, once you get to know him, you, it's easier to communicate with him than you would think. 
And um, so we start, I started asking him, do you like doing these videos with me? And most of the time he says, yes. Sometimes he rolls his eyes at me like, oh. But I, I told him, you know, Joe, this could be your career. Um, when we do career assessment inventories with him, which sounds like a, a lot of paperwork, but actually what it is is just asking people what their preferences are. Like, do you like to be inside or outside? Do you like to work with people or alone? So asking those questions to a person with a disability is a great way to figure out kind of what their uh, choices might be once they're done with school and they can get a job or volunteer or something like that. And so Joe has always expressed happiness with helping other people. When he helps someone else, it makes him feel really good. And one of the ways that we realize Joe can help other people is by helping them understand uh, yeah. Uh, people with disabilities. So you heard him agree with me just now. All right. <laughs> Mom very, got it right. <laughs> this is very important to Joe. So that that's really why we, we ended up continuing to do it even after we weren't quarantined anymore because it's important to Joe. So, Are you involved in other advocacy efforts as well? Um, yeah, um, I'm involved in um, uh, something called the GAPD. It's the Georgia Participant Direct Stakeholders Group, um, which is um, uh, a group of people who have the NOW and COMP waiver. In Georgia, that is a Medicaid waiver program that provides supports like our caregivers. And it provides for other things that are not medical related, but are disability related. And, um, and then Joe is involved in Uniting for Change, which is a group of uh, people with disabilities, young people with disabilities, and they do a weekly Zoom meeting. So Joe is real into Zoom meetings now. That's the main way he is able to connect with people his age when he's not in school. Mm -hmm. And he's also involved in a group called um, Center for Youth Voice, Youth Choice. And they are training um, young people to be advocates. So mm -hmm. Joe is building um, his career through these advocacy connections that he's making. That's really wonderful. Um, it's just sort of, mm -hmm. that it's become like a career path that maybe, I don't know if you would have ever expected that that would have, um, you know, turned out that way for him. Yeah, not really, because honestly, I thought, well, he's <clears throat> nonverbal. How can he participate? But there is nothing like a group of disabled people getting together to support each other and encourage each other. I mean, they do not, uh, it is the one place in Joe's life where people don't see his disability first. They see right. him as a person and that as a caregiver, as a parent, that is music to my ears. Right. That's amazing. What about advocating for Joe as a patient in his medical care? How is that changing as he gets older, becomes an adult? Uh, well, um, what we've done is created, um, there is a couple of different things you can do. You can do guardianship, but we chose to do power of attorney instead. So Joe uh, retains his essential rights as a citizen because he's over age 18. Um, so we have power of attorneys. And it's just like if you did an advanced directive for a person in your family so that if they go to the hospital and they can't talk to the doctors we can talk to the doctors. So that's that's basically the same as you would do for a, a parent or, you know, a, a sibling. That's That's been kind of a learning curve for us because prior to that, we just did, made all the decisions and 
made all the choices. But um, now we're trying to include Joe and encourage him because, you know, frankly, we're telling him, you know, Joe, we're not going to be around forever and ever. Mm-hmm. And you may not want your sister to make these decisions <laughs> for you. <laughs> so, so we're practicing. We're, we're learning a new way. It's, it's more challenging than when you have a young child and, and uh, well, it's I just... can't say more challenge. It's a different challenge. It's a different challenge. What about the future? Uh, how are you, you kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier, but how are you planning for Joe's care as you both age? Wow. Um, well, we both try to do a lot of exercise and we plan on living forever. But besides <laughs> <Perfect>. that, <laughs> that's a that's a great question. You know, we've um, you know we've enlisted the the aid of a uh, you know of an attorney to make a to make plans for for Joe, um, and of course uh, Joe's sister, our daughter Sam, will be you know heavily involved in in a lot of that and has been, and you know we we envision at some point probably living closer to Sam, you know, sort sort of our own transition planning. You know, Jane has become an expert in, in transitioning for for families that are kind of like ours. Well we're you know we're gonna be transitioning too eventually and, and that'll probably involve, you know, living closer to Sam and then um and sort of working at it that way. Yeah, one thing that I I think, well, two things. One is I think you have to have uh, that community, Um, however it looks. Um, If if a person with a disability doesn't have a community around them, they are vulnerable. Um, And community can have a lot of different definitions. So I think right now we're trying to find what Joe's community could be. Um, uh, And then, you know, one thing that surprised me is when Joe was younger, I thought, okay, you make a transition plan and then you're good. You're good to go. But what I have learned is that Um, What a child thinks about their future when they are in elementary school and what they think about as they, uh, what they want for their future when they're uh, 15 and then what they want when they're 20 and 25, it changes over time. So I think you have to look at making future plans as sort of a fluid process. So you may have some plans, uh, your child may dream of being a firefighter and when they're little and you know that's probably not gonna be true. And then they get to high school and they talk about being a, uh, you know, a, a influencer on, <laughs> you know, on, <laughs> on uh, social media. And then, and then, but you realize, well, that's, probably not going to happen. So you support them in in making their dreams come true. And meanwhile, you're looking around and your friends are all, their children are graduating from college. Maybe they're getting married. Maybe they're having grandchildren. And your child is, that is not going to be their future. So you have to look at what are we going to do as aging adults for ourselves you know, taking into account, you know, potential things like our own health and our, you know, hopefully, you know, we'll have our, we won't have to deal with any type of neurological disabilities on our own parts. And then, and then accept that Joe is going to want an adult life like any other person. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I talk to a young person with a disability, even the nonverbal ones who say, I don't want to live with my parents anymore. Mm -hmm. That is normal. So how do you, you know, you have to be open to planning for those um, dreams and hopes and wishes and also take care of your own. My final question for you, what advice would you give to other parents who are caring for children with CP 
or another condition like it? Um, definitely partner with your school um, because that is such a, an essential resource um, for the, uh, you know, a good chunk of the beginning of their life, you know, um, well, early intervention services up until age three, but then school kicks in and they'll be in school for a while. So partnering with the school is really a great way for you to learn how to um, deal with some of the things that uh, are needs for a person with a disability as they get older. You kind of learn how to navigate big systems and um, collaborate with the team. So that's a really important thing to do. Um, <clears throat> Start uh, talking about your dreams um, and with your child. What what is what are your child's dreams? Um, and maybe talking to them about being a person with a disability. You know, it's not a it's not something you should hide. Not that that has to be your whole identity, but having conversations about like we've been talking about. Joe, like a person, you know, you're a person with CP and uh, just matter of fact. Um, and, um, and don't be afraid to ask for help when you need it. Um, it's really hard for families sometimes, especially if they come from a, honestly, a middle class background uh, to uh, uh, sort of wrap their minds around the, the need for Medicaid services hmm. because healthcare costs can be devastating for a family. Um, you know, the, even if your child doesn't have uh, a case of CP like Joe, where they're maybe not as impacted, you still have numerous doctors and numerous therapies that are needed and medications sometimes. And, you know, uh, accepting that maybe asking for help from a service, uh, an, a government agency or a friend, you know, um, is, is okay. It'll, you know, it may be a little hard to learn how to do it, but once you do, it'll be okay. And um, I think that's really, really saved me. I'm not an ask for help person, or I didn't think I was, but now I understand that there's value in that. And, um, and, and you're doing a nice thing for that person. Maybe they're standing there watching you, wondering if there's anything they can do to help and they don't know how to ask. So if you ask them, you know, it, it's uh, really kind of a wonderful thing. So um, that, that was a big lesson for me. Building your community, as Jane mentioned earlier, is, is very important, I think, for, um, you know, for other parents with children with CP or, or other disabilities, you know, making sure that there's, uh, that there's social engagement in their lives because kids are kids. You know, they, um, they naturally gravitate toward other kids and they, they're not necessarily looking at, you know, checking disabilities at the door, that kind of thing. So I think it's important to um, be as involved as you can. I'm curious if both of you have any advice you would give to um, other caregivers or other parents caring for children who are really kind of struggling to find a space where they can nurture themselves and take care of themselves. Do you have any um, advice for, for people who would really hesitate to sort of put down their caregiving duties and pay attention to themselves? Depression is a real thing. There is all kinds of statistical data on marriages breaking up and people struggling with mental well-being issues when they have a child with significant disabilities. And so I think sometimes you just have to really look at things objectively and realize maybe some counseling services would be beneficial. Um, you kind of like you, like it's the last thing that you do um, is think about taking care of yourself. But if you don't take care of yourself, who is going to take care of your child? 
While there are definitely organizations and some and groups that that advocate for um, for caregiver care, if you will, it's it's not something that the system is generally built to support. So you really do have to have to make an effort. And that's an important effort, um, you know, because as James said, right? You got to you've got to make sure number one is is operating on all cylinders or as many as possible, so that you can take care of everything else. And um, no, but it's, but the, as you know, and you probably learned in the series, the system is is not necessarily set up to support the caregiver so much. And so that that's why it self care, I, I think, is the phrase I've heard a lot today is so important, um, you know, you, to adhere to that as much as possible. Jane and Jerry and Joe Grillo really want to thank you all so much for talking with us today and sharing your experience as caregivers. I think this is such an important topic that does not get enough attention. So we really appreciate you being able to, to speak with us about it. Thanks. For Thanks, Shannon. Us. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hope everyone has a great week and we'll talk to you next time. Thank you.